Hey everyone, I'm Nathan Hughes. Welcome to the Reconcile Podcast. We're so glad that you're here. We believe that God is calling all of us to a better future and to look inside and see our potential. That's really what this podcast is all about. So I'm glad that you checked this message out. Hope that you enjoy it and be encouraged. Let's all go out and reconcile the world. Life was never supposed to be mundane. It was never supposed to feel boring. That wasn't God's intention for his creation. So this holiday season, let's rediscover the wonder of Christmas together. Let's be reminded of who God is and what he came to do and the mission that he calls all of us to this Christmas season. If you guys have your Bibles or your phones with you, you guys could open up to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 17. So the first week we talked about the wonder of Christmas and that the fact that God was with us and that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And one of the questions that we asked is why did the word have to become flesh? And one of the main answers was because he had to become flesh so that he could die for us in order to save us. And the fact that he made his dwelling among us, that word dwell means to really to pitch a tent. And a tent was the the main way that a lot of people lived back in that day. And what that means for us is that God longs to have fellowship and community with us. He longs longs to have a relationship with us. That's what that word dwell means. It means um, in that time, when you set up a tent, you were making your home. And so God made his home among us, and he wanted to have a relationship with us, and that's why he had to come. And then in the second week, we talked about how It's this crazy miracle of God being in us through the power of the Holy Spirit and how our ability to think deeper thoughts and to have um, meaningful conversations about life, about meaning, about morality, about destiny. Like, where are we going? I know that I had a beginning and I know that there's gonna be some sort of an end. What does all this stuff mean? The Holy Spirit being alive in us is what gives us the ability to even have those conversations. So we talked about the way of the spirit um, is a high, elevated way of life and that our fleshly nature is really this lower way of life that brings destruction. And this week, in order to kind of wrap it up and to get us ready for the Christmas season, um, the fact that God was with us and now that God is in us, the world was changed forever. The world was changed forever. And even if we just look back on Um, Jesus and his life and his death and the resurrection and what that did to people back then who witnessed it and then to also people who heard the gospel message, it changed everything for them. And I had this thought of like Christmas and the birth of Jesus, it did more than split the calendar. It really has transformed the hearts and lives of millions of people, millions of people. And that's really what the Christmas story is all about. And I was reading through some statistics this week, and nine out of 10 Americans celebrate Christmas in this year of 2018. Nine out of 10 will. And five out of 10 celebrate for religious reasons. So that means half of the people that celebrate Christmas just celebrate Christmas because it's just something fun that they do with their family. And I was thinking about that statistic, and I'm like, man, Half of the people in our country alone are missing out on the real meaning behind Christmas and what Jesus came to do and has done for thousands of years. And that's changed our world. And I was just reflecting and thinking back. And again, I talk about how so often in my life, I'm hesitant to say that I'm experiencing God in this present moment because it takes faith to experience God. It's only by faith that we can experience God. And in this present moment, I've gotten better at recognizing the extraordinary in the ordinary. And even when I'm having conversations with close friends, I can now be like, wow, this conversation is happening because of the spirit of God being alive and present. And this has taken time for me. It has. But always when I get through an experience or a meaningful conversation or an event in my life, and when I look back, I can always see where God was moving and what he was up to. So it takes faith in that moment, and I've gotten better at recognizing his spirit and presence being active and alive, working through me and others, 
And it's a beautiful thing. There's nothing like it. It changes you. But always when I reflect on my life and look back, I can realize, yep, he was there. He was faithful. And so I asked the question tonight, you guys, maybe you're like me and you're hesitant to say that you have, are, have, can experience God's presence right here in the present moment, but I'm here to say that one of the main um, proofs of his presence in your life is the fact that his presence leaves you changed forever. It changes you. To be in God's presence means that you're gonna experience change. It's impossible to be in his presence and not be changed. Even when you reflect back on the life of Moses and anybody that experienced God's presence, it did something to them. First, it was terrifying. Can you imagine just experiencing God in his full, like, no, we can't, we can't. We can try, we can I can't even imagine that. John, in the book of Revelation, throws out color after color after precious stone and all these just imaginative language to describe what it was like to experience God's presence. But I can tell you one thing is that John was changed. He was. And so as I'm going back and I'm, I'm praying through this and God gave me this, this passage to talk about, I wanted to talk about how a world has changed. How a world has changed. And if millions of people have experienced life transformation and God's spirit and presence has done more than just split the calendar, how can our world still be changed today? How can Christmas change your world and my world this holiday season? And so one of the passages that God placed on my heart came out of Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. And I, I feel like Deep down, and please just give me a head nod or something, but I feel like deep down, every single one of us longs to make an impact in this world. I mean, I'm, I think, and I think that deep down, all of us long to be a part of changing this world. And sometimes we just don't know how to do that. Or sometimes we don't even know what it is that we want to do, but we know that we want to change the world. And I know that I'm not the only one who has those feelings and those longings and those desires. And so what I'm gonna address tonight is how do we change the world? Because Jesus gave us this roadmap. He came and lived this life and he's given us everything we need to experience his power and presence in our life, which leaves us changed and then changes the world around us. So let's jump into this passage. We're gonna talk about that tonight. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. So just to set the stage and to give us some context, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And this will be his last time traveling up to Jerusalem because he'll then be crucified. So in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, it says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem from the Galilee region. And on the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. This was not the first time that Jesus told his disciples what was going to happen. And over and over and over again, they just don't get it. They don't. And this is what the difference of having Jesus beside us is, and having Jesus inside of us. So it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came into their life that they then looked back on these events and they were like, oh, I get it now. Because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in all truth and righteousness. When you think of the word righteousness, just think of right living or right thinking. So really the disciples were a bunch of idiots until they experienced the Holy Spirit. So then I asked myself, I'm like, well, what's my excuse? Because I have the Holy Spirit now, right? And sometimes I'm just an idiot. It wasn't that funny. I'll cut that out for my next one. So they don't get it. And he's telling them over and over again what's getting ready to happen. And the story gets better. In verse 20, then the mother of two of his disciples, the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, so these two guys, their mother comes to Jesus with her sons. How embarrassing is this? And kneeling down in front of Jesus, she asked him for a favor. Gosh, 
she must really want whatever it is she's getting ready to ask. Like she's on her knees getting ready to beg Jesus for this favor. What is she getting ready to ask him? And he said, this is one of my favorite questions that Jesus asks, and I guarantee he's still asking you this question today. He says, what do you want? What do you want? I feel like 90% of my struggles in conflict in life, in my relationships, I feel like this question always just eliminates all of, all of them. I'll be in a situation and I don't know what to do and I'm freaking out and then I'll have someone that I love and trust they'll look me in the eyes and they'll say, what do you want? This question has this way of just piercing through all the crap in our life, right? All the lies, all the things that we think we want and it gets to the heart of the matter. That's why Jesus always asks this question because he's always concerned with what? He's concerned with your heart. And so he's getting to what is inside of this mother's heart. And he says, what do you want? She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left when you enter into your kingdom. So what is she asking Jesus for? She's asking Jesus for her, the status of her sons to be elevated to the level of king. Because remember, they didn't have the Holy Spirit at this time. So when Jesus talked about a kingdom and talked about reigning, they thought he was gonna overthrow Jerusalem. They thought they were gonna take the land back. They didn't realize what Jesus was getting ready to go and experience and do, even though he told them plainly. It wasn't until after when they looked back and they had the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and they were like, oh my gosh, I get it. So this mom straight up is on her knees begging Jesus for the status of her two sons to be elevated. Wouldn't you be a little embarrassed? Just a little? What is that like? What can we even relate that to today? <laughs> That's like when, um, <laughs> yeah, I, don't th I think we, all of us are past this, but we're at this generation where if the, the kids come home and they get like a C or D on the test, the parents will call the teacher and make it seem like it's the teacher's fault, right? When really your kids just need to study. And you have these helicopter parents now and all the parents are phoning the teachers. I feel like that's what we're, like we're back in this time period where the parents are just concerned with elevating the status of their kids. They're not really concerned about what's going on in the heart of their child. Yeah, it's crazy. And so she's saying, can you, can you elevate the status of my sons, please? Let one of them sit at your right and your left when you enter into your glory. But this is not the way that you change the world. This is not Jesus' mission. This is not what he came to do. This isn't what the Christmas story means. Jesus didn't come to elevate our status. He didn't. He came to change the world. So let's keep reading. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup? Can you experience the future that I'm getting ready to walk into? Can you walk into this very same future? Can you take up your cross? Can you follow me? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from this cup because he knew their future. He did. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. And over and over and over again, you guys, in the gospels, Jesus said, I only do what the father tells me. Because remember the wonder of Christmas. This is something that you're gonna continue to wrestle with probably for as long as you're alive. Jesus was fully man and he was fully God. I've taken, I don't know how many classes on this and it still blows my mind because I don't think we were created to, to figure God out because if we figured him out, the relationship would be killed. There would be no wonder. There'd be no curiosity. There'd be no intimacy. If we could figure somebody out, there'd be no relationship. And so Jesus said, you will indeed drink from this cup but to sit at my right or left, that's for my father to decide because I only do what the father tells me. And then the 10 heard about this because there was 12. The 10 heard about these two trying to elevate their status and using mom as leverage. And they all got furious. This word indignant, it means just righteously angry. So upset with the two brothers. And then Jesus called them together and he said, you guys, come on. 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord their power and authority over them. Why? Because they're concerned about their status. They're concerned about their status. And their high officials, the ones with status, exercise their authority over them. Not so with you. If you wanna change the world, you need to stop being so concerned about your status and you need to start being more concerned about your service. That's what Jesus is getting ready to tell them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. You guys, if you remember anything from this message, please wrestle through this in your spirit and your mind. How many of us today in our day and age are being taught and reinforced to care more about our status than anything else? Even Christmas, half of the people that celebrate Christmas are more concerned about what they're gonna get for Christmas, not what they're gonna give for Christmas. It's mind blowing. Everything that the world teaches us goes against these principles that Jesus came to show us. And so often we wanna change the world, right? We wanna be great. You, we gotta stop being afraid of the greatness that's being placed inside of us. I'm serious. I, I had this moment in, in, uh, in church on Sunday and I was looking at all the people that were in this room. And I'm like, man, if you could just, just realize Realize the faith that it took to get you in this room on this Sunday. If you could just tap into the faith that it took to get you into this room on a Sunday to be present here for an hour, if you could tap into that faith and start to work it and really believe in it, think about it, think deeply about it, I think that you would actually start to change the world. But so often we're like on autopilot, we're like these robots. And it's because we're more concerned about our status and our service. And we're more concerned about changing our world than we are the world. He said, whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. How many people have fought for their status? How many people have argued for their status? How many people have felt this deep, deep desire to prove to the world that you're somebody or something? Yeah. You know, that's a fight that you should never, ever, ever have to enter into. And I want you guys to just say this in your head, in your hearts. My status is not my business. My status is not my business. I want you guys to truly believe that. Because we can get so caught up worrying about our status and we will miss out on all that God has for us. Be more concerned about your service than you are your status. And if you wanna be great, if you really wanna change this world, I'm telling you, Start looking for ways to serve others, not to be served. And if you can embody anything this Christmas season, I'm telling you, you wanna know why family gatherings are always such a struggle? It's because we're all looking for ways that we could be served. And we're looking for ways to protect our status. It's crazy. If you just forgot about your status this Christmas season and you never thought about it and you just only focused on the ways that you're serving those around you, I'm telling you, this would be a Christmas that you would never forget, ever. And you wanna know why I think that we all are so focused on our status rather than how we're serving? I think it's because a lot of us are hurt inside. And I think that we're afraid to open up to each other about that. I do. 
And the Bible tells me so too. And this is crazy. I learned this in school, you guys, and it's something that's so common sense. But what common sense is, is often it's not common practice. Let's just look at the next story to come. Let's look at this real quick together. That's why, I, honestly, I, I, I can't even, when I'm actually trying to read the Bible, I don't even want to use my phone anymore because I, this has helped me so much. Let's just look at the next story. You got these two people that are coming to Jesus and their mom is begging that Jesus would elevate their status. And they're so concerned about their status and it's because I don't think they realize how much they're actually hurting inside. And it's really not their status that they're concerned about. It's their feelings of not being loved or not being enough or not being valued. Check this out. You guys, please, come on, wake up. Wake up. Verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him because Jericho was on the way to Jerusalem. A large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. Whoa. Just a couple paragraphs above this, you guys, I'm telling you. I learned this in school. Please, you don't have to go to school. Just learn it here right now. We just, we just heard about two men up top, right? But now two men are showing up again. Oh, that must mean something. Somehow, some way, these stories could possibly be related. We, like the Holy Spirit gives us this ability to think deeply, okay? So as they're going to Jerusalem, Jesus just tried his hardest to teach his stupid disciples about being great and changing the world and stop being concerned about your status and start actually being more concerned about how you're serving. And now they're on their way from Jericho and a large crowd following them. And two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted. They said, Lord, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. What? You got these two men that were just asking for their status to be elevated, and now you have these two men asking for Jesus to have mercy on them. What's the difference? The crowd rebuked the blind men and told them to be quiet. Why would they rebuke the blind men? Because they were only concerned about status. Who do you think you are approaching the son of God? Back up. Hold up. I think you need a back up because you've forgotten why the son of God came. I'm telling you guys, God's word is crazy. It's so revealing. And they told these blind men to back up because they were more concerned about their status. And what did the blind men do? They shouted all the louder. They said, son of David, have mercy on us. Again, God, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he called to them. And he asked them my favorite question again. Read it, it's there. He says, what do you want? What do you want? And they answered, they said, we want to see. We want to see. Jesus had compassion on them, and he touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. Do you guys see the difference in these stories? So you've got the sons of Zebedee who were so concerned about their status. And really when we're concerned about our status and when we're fighting for our status and we're looking for ways or, or ways that we're not being served, right? Because that's what they're doing. Well, if, if I'm going to follow you, i got to sit at your right and your left. I have to be served too. When we do that and we fight to try to justify ourselves, improve ourselves, it's because we're hurting. It's just people can't see it. So then we don't show it. 
And when we're not honest about what's going on inside of us, Jesus can't heal us. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I'm sorry if I seem fired up or passionate about this. It's just because I experience this all the time too and I'm sick of it. What happens when you're blind? You can't hide your dysfunction. You can't hide your disorder. And more than anything else, you want to be made well. And I'm telling you, the Bible, it's literal at times. And it's like, even in it being literal, it's actually spiritual. And what really what this story is trying to tell us is that we're spiritually blind. And at times we can be so concerned about our status when God cares more about our heart. And he wants to tell you, stop fighting for your status. Stop looking for ways that you're not being served. He says, start looking inside at your heart. Recognize that sin has left us broken and only I, the savior of the world, can put you back together. That's the Christmas story. That's the Christmas story, you guys. And I'm telling you, if we just all recognize our brokenness, we will all get along so much better. But when we all try to pretend and act like we're not blind, we're more concerned about our status and that leaves us feeling more divided than ever. It's crazy. And then after you recognize your brokenness and what sin has done to you, Jesus comes into your life and he changes you forever because to be in God's presence is to be changed. And you can't tell me you've experienced God's presence in your life and not be changed. It's impossible. It's impossible. And this is what happens. It's beautiful. It's amazing. After you've come to this conclusion about your heart and your soul and your life, your eyes are opened you're able to stop thinking about your pain and you're able to see others and their pain. And then you're able to love them in a way that they need you to love them. And then they experience God through you. It's wild. And so I think this Christmas season, we need to be reminded of just the, the truth of Christmas. And that's that we were all broken and bruised by sin and we could not become whole and put back together if it was not for Jesus Christ. And then after you experience his presence and his spirit and his power in your life, you start to become an agent of healing. Your eyes stop going inward and they start going outward. And then you start to believe in the greatness that's inside of you and you wanna be great, then serve. It's not about your status, it's about your service. That's the Christmas story. That's how this world is gonna change. And th this is what happens, you guys. This is what I want us to embody more than anything else. After this has happened, God's spirit is alive in you in a way that you've never experienced it. And I think God wants to reveal to all of us that we have what's inside of us. We have enough inside of us to change this world. We do. We just need to believe it. We need to believe it. When you recognize your brokenness and you're honest about your hurting and your pain, you start to become an agent of healing. And God's spirit is alive in you in such a powerful way that you start to bring his presence everywhere that you go. I'm telling you. And you start to see people that are in need. You start to see people that even need just a smile. And you start to change the world. There's a song that we're gonna get ready to sing together. And music has a way of having many different interpretations for us, right? So this is what my prayer is for this song for us. Every time, and you guys, this, is, this could be like, maybe we're gonna have to cut this part out because this can be taken such the wrong way. This is not coming from a pride or a sense of being conceited, right? This is coming from a sense of knowing that you're in pain, knowing that you've been broken and the only thing that can heal you and put you back together is Jesus Christ. After that happens, you experience something, you're changed. And then every time you encounter someone, they notice there's something different about you. And I know that I'm, I'm almost scared to say this, but again, it's because I need this message too. You need to believe in the spirit that is inside of you, not yourself. Believe in the spirit that is inside of you. 
And I, this is what I was gonna say, and I'm just gonna say it. I'm, I'm done talking about what I'm gonna say, and I'm actually gonna say it, all right? You guys ready? <laughs> Whenever you guys enter a room this Christmas season, I want you to think this thought, here comes heaven. Here comes heaven. Whenever you enter into a conversation with someone, I want you to think this thought, here comes heaven. Whenever you hug somebody or embrace them, right before I want you to think, here comes heaven. Here comes heaven. And the reason why I think I'm scared to say that is because I think a lot of us don't actually believe that. And this Christmas, like the greatest gift you can ever give yourself is actually believing that and having confidence in God's spirit in you. You guys, God's spirit is so alive in you and I want you to tap into it this Christmas season more than anything else. That's my prayer. Whenever we enter a room, we need to be saying, here comes heaven. How can I love the people that are in front of me? Because I know we're all hurting. I know we're all broken. And this world needs more of me. It does. And when I say me, I say I mean Jesus, right? Don't at me. Here comes heaven. And I believe that about you. I need you to believe it about yourself. Here comes heaven. Every time you guys get ready to lead us in a song, I need you to believe that. Here comes heaven. Yeah. It's the wonder of Christmas. It's mind blowing to me. We have an opportunity to connect what is eternal to what is finite to bring heaven to earth. And I'm telling you, this guy walked by me in the gym and he smiled at me and said hi. And I was like, like, what was that? Because I'm used to mean mugs and guys on roids like wanting, looking at me like I'm a chihuahua or something. I'm like, these guys, and I was just like, this guy just changed my world by the way he looked at me and smiled at me and said, hey. And I, I, was, I was messed up. You guys can ask Sam. I was like, dude, this guy just said hi to me, but it was different. It was different. And I want, I want that in all of us. I want when, it doesn't matter where we go. I want people to be like, what? what? What was that? And you say, here comes heaven. Get ready for it. Because if you're gonna be around me, you're gonna receive it. It's impossible because to be in God's presence means to be changed forever. And that's the Christmas story. It's crazy. It's hard to believe, but it is believable because I've been changed by it. Here comes heaven. Believe that about yourself this season and forever. Please, come on. Let that be our prayer. I really, when I hear this song, what are the lyrics um, about the angels and, and all that? What it, so it says, angels, let your song begin. And when I hear this song, I just imagine, because there really are angels. They do exist because the Bible told me so. And I imagine these angels getting ready to sing this song to empower us to be heaven on earth. And I feel like these angels are saying, get ready, earth, because here comes heaven. And I need us to believe that. So let's believe that. Receive that tonight. And then take that with you wherever you go. That's how this world is gonna change.